Hello, today we're going to be talking about social cognitive theory, which is our next major learning theory in the class. And um, hopefully today we'll see how this is really just a connection and a um, to behaviors and extension of what we learned in our last module on behaviorism. So social cognitive theory, our guiding questions today are what constructs um, does social cognitive theory entail and what relations are hypothesized to exist between these constructs. So when we think about social cognitive theory, the name that should stick in your mind is Albert Bandura. And he really was thinking about expanding behaviorism to think about learning not just as a change in behavior, but a change in those mental processes that create the capacity to demonstrate behaviors. So he wasn't just thinking about um, the environment changing behaviors, but really what was happening in the brain and in the body that caused um, those behaviors to be able to be changed. Um, and that this change wasn't just happening internally or with external factors, but that part of those external factors um, were by observing others. So modeling is really important. That social context um, is important to social cognitive theory. So when we think about the name, we have social, which is the modeling, the external um, environmental influences, and we have cognitive, which is the processes that are happening in our brain and inside of ourselves that cause the capacity to change behaviors. Um, so we think about how this is different than behaviorism, and behaviorism is really just that change in behavior, and we're only really looking at behavior where social cognitive theory expands upon that to include also the internal processes, the mental processes that are happening. Um, and then the change in behavior doesn't have to be an immediate change. That change could happen over time or it could be delayed. Um, and there's no direct reinforcement or punishment of the behaviors, or there doesn't have to be um, in this model. Um, it's really based upon this idea of reciprocal causation. And I want to talk about reciprocal causation because this is a really fundamental model for this plan. And this diagram, again, should be one of those things that you really think about when you think about reciprocal causation. When you think about social cognitive theory, I want you to think about this model. So we know that our behavior and the environment are determined by each other. And this is really the behaviorist model here that um, that our environment determines our behavior, that when I get rewarded for something, um, I do it more, right? Um, and also, and then when I do something, the um, that causes my environment to change. That causes someone to be happy with me and give me more rewards. So it's a reciprocal model and that those reinforce each other. Um, for example, if, um, if I read a book and I get a candy, then I read more books, so I get more candy, so I read more books, so I get more candy, and that cycle continues, right? That our environment and our behavior affect each other. So let's talk about how personal determinants, I mean, that those mental processes, our personal determinants also affect our behavior and our environment. So first, um, our behavior determines how we feel, right? So if I do really well on a math test, I'm going to feel better about my math. So when I do math, I feel good, right? That's, I start to have self-efficacy. I feel better, right? And then when I do better and I feel good about math, then I want to do math more. So that builds upon each other, right? That feeling good about doing something increases that behavior. The opposite can happen too, right? If I fail a math test, and I feel really bad about it, then I'm going to be I'm not gonna have self-efficacy. I'm gonna feel worse about math. I'm gonna do less math. I'm gonna practice less, which means I'm gonna do worse on my math, which means I'm gonna feel worse and it's gonna go downhill, right? Um, and then our environment also affects how I feel. So let's say that I don't feel good about myself in math, but then my teacher says, wow, you're really, really good at math. You, work, you can really, if you try, you can do great at math, but I'm gonna feel better about myself, right? Um, in the same way, if I feel better about myself in math, then that's going to affect the way the teacher sees me, and then the teacher's going to give me more positive reinforcement. Or negatively, if, the, if I have a bad attitude towards math and the teacher feels that, then it's going to affect the way the teacher interacts with me. So all of these things cause are causes and effects of each other. That's what the word reciprocal means, that the personal determinants, the behavioral determinants, and the environmental determinants are all causes and effects of each other. So let's talk a little bit about some of those personal determinants. What do we mean by personal determinants? 
Um, some examples, the, the biggest factor for Bandura in this model is um, the personal determinant of self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is my belief in my ability to perform a task. So do I think I can do it? Um, so think about writing a paper. Do you approach it differently if you have high or low self-efficacy? If you think you can do the paper, are you more likely to just get started and do it? Um, or um, how, what's, how does it affect your motivation? Um, standards. Um, that's the criteria for successful task completion. So what are your standards um, for knowing if you were successful? So if you have really high standards for yourself um, or lower standards. Um, do you approach writing a paper differently if you're aiming for a C versus if you're aiming for an A? So think about how that affects the way you approach um, your motivation for writing a paper, right? And then your physiological state, that's another personal determinant. Um, so for example, anxiety causes increased heart rate, sweat. Um, if you're at a high arousal state versus being relaxed. So um, think it out if you know, you're right before the deadline and there's lots of pressure versus if it's relaxed, you have lots of time. How does that affect the way that you approach this paper and your success on that paper? And again, um, some people feel like they do better if they're under more pressure. I think the research pretty, is pretty mixed on that one, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide. These are three aspects of personal determinants, with things that inside of yourself that affect um, your motivation or your behaviors, right? Um, then we have environmental determinants. These are the things on the outside world. Um, these are behavioral, cognitive, and affective changes derived from observing one or more models. So we have mastery experiences. So um, the first one, mastery experiences, um, when you have repeated successes, you have greater self-efficacy. Um, repeated um, failures undermine self-efficacy. So when you do well, that's one environmental determinant is doing well, having mastery, depending on what your standards are, um, increases your self-efficacy, which then of course changes your behavior. Um, that's the most powerful, but another one that's really important is modeling. So this is this idea that you don't have to experience um, yourself, those mastery experiences, but you can watch others and you can learn from others' experiences and you can model yourself after others. And that's in fact, in fact something that we as human beings are really good at doing and something that we do a lot of. So the first question is who makes the best model? Um, someone that you perceive as similar and as competent as you are and is of the same status as you. So um, when we're young, our parents are part of our social group, our families, and so we use them as models. Um, brothers and sisters make great models or people we model ourselves after. Um, you know, and as we get older, those models change to our peer groups, right? Um, and depending on who we consider our peers, right? Um, sometimes our models maybe are a little bit um, aspirational. Um, so if we see that we could be like that, it could be someone who is of our same race, of our same social class, um, of someone that we feel like we could aspire to be. And we also have what we call vicarious learning. Um, and that is when we learn by watching someone else. And in fact, um, these mirror neurons in our brains actually respond the same way as if we were actually doing the activity. That's why like when you watch um, football on TV, your adrenaline goes up and, it, and you get really invested in the game. That's because your mirror neurons are firing. And it's almost as if your body's reacting as if you are also participating in the game, if you are also playing football with them. So when we watch someone else participate in activity, we mirror neurons go off as if we were also participating. So we can learn from someone else doing an activity, we don't have to do it ourselves. That's why we can experience and feel pain, you know, and feel empathy for someone when they experience pain. We're not actually experiencing that pain, but we can feel the pain that other people might feel. Um, and so that's why, luckily, we don't have to touch the hot stove. We can just watch our little brother do it and learn, right, from his example to not touch the hot stove, right? Um, social persuasion, um, that's in peer pressure and wanting to be a part of a group and participating or doing activities or changing our behavior because of our social group. Um, and when is that most powerful? Um, at what period in our lives um, and which peer groups 
and to do what types of things. Just think about how all of those factors of development might influence social persuasion. So as you can see, these modeling, vicarious learning, social persuasions are all really important parts of these environmental determinants, things that change our behavior within our environment um, that are different from um, the strict rewards and punishments and uh, mastery experiences um, that are really behavioristic. Um, and then think about the reciprocal relationships with these personal determinants. So all of these um, can be reinforced and um, with these personal determinants that they, they interact really strongly with our internal mental processes. And then we have behavioral determinants. That's what we do. Um, and they're one of the behavioral determinants that's really important are what we call self-regulatory processes. And we'll talk a lot about self-regulation in another lecture later on. Um, but self-regulation is really this um, use of processes that to, to activate and sustain thoughts. It's really this idea of thinking about our own thinking and regulating our own thinking and behaviors to attain the goals we need. So delayed gratification, making ourselves do things we don't necessarily want to do, and um, making ourselves really pay attention and attend to things that are important. So things like setting goals, monitoring progress, using effective strategies, and assessing our goal attainment. So can we make sure that we stay on track and do the things that we need to do to stay on track? Um, and that's paired with the actions that we do. So one behavioral determinant is, do we have the self-regulation to do the things that we should do? Um, so it's kind of thinking about how do, how does this interact with the reinforcement that we get from our environment and our, um, and our personal determinants, the way that we feel. So, um, one question that we are still answering today is how likely is it that an adolescent is imitating risky or dangerous behaviors that we see in movies, video games, or television? Um, and if you want to watch, the please watch the video um, of Bandura and the Bobo doll experiment that's also in the Canvas site um, that will give you background on the modeling that Bandura was looking at and really thinking about the influence of media, you know, it, um, back in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, is this true um, as we move older? So he did his experiment with young children. Does this same thing hold true as we get older? And um, does it make sense um, to think about um, in our society? Um, so our guiding questions today were, um, what constructs do they entail? And again, I want you to really think about personal, behavioral, and environmental de determinants and how that interacts with modeling of social behaviors um, and, and thinking about those reciprocal relationships between them. There's a lot to unpack here um, with this theory. It's really powerful to describe behaviors. It goes much more beyond a strict behaviorist standpoint. And it's really the first time that we can really start using what we know about psychology and the inner workings of our brains um, and our cognitive and mental processes to really think about and deconstruct the things and the psychology that's behind what's happening in our classrooms. So think about this. Think about examples of when this might have happened in your life. And if you have questions about this theory, please feel free to ask me. I'd be happy to sit down and chat with you about it at any time. Thanks. Have a great day.